Hi, this is Caleb Aylesworth for CG Tuts, and today we're going to be talking about some quick yet very effective ways of rendering and laying out your video game art for the purposes of displaying in a portfolio. The software that we'll be using for this first part of the tutorial is 3D Studio Max 2010, and some topics that we'll be covering are setting up your camera, three-point lighting systems, using hardware rendering to quickly place some aesthetically pleasing cast shadows on your model, the light tracer plugin in conjunction with anti-aliasing filters and global super sampling to get a very refined and high quality final render, and we'll also be going over how to do a clay and wireframe render to show off your optimized modeling. The first thing that we're going to want to do if we're going to be setting up renders is we want to make sure that we have a nice angle of our asset, a very flattering sort of uh, way to look at it. So the first thing we're going to want to do is set up our camera. So the way that I like to do that is I like to go in my perspective view and I'll kind of spin around my asset and look at it from a few different angles and try to figure out a perspective that shows it off really nicely for my first beauty render. So um, I like a nice three-quarter sort of angle for this asset, um, almost with our eye level sort of midway up so we can see a little bit of the, the top of the base and uh, we can also see a lot of the detail on the phone itself and some of the details on the side uh, but we won't be looking down from the top of the payphone. So I kind of like this angle. So now to set up a camera once I have a, a good angle in my perspective view you just use the hot key control C and uh, that'll automatically create a camera for you. Now the next thing that I like to do is I like to get a, an aspect ratio that's going to work for me too. Right now, um, if you go over to your render setup, it's on custom. And it's at 800 by 6, 600, which is sort of like a just a default preset custom camera angle. But it's almost square, and it's not very flattering. And also, when you render, you're going to be rendering a lot of empty dead space, and uh, that will significantly increase your render times. So what I like to do is I like to go into my own custom setups here and I like to choose an aspect ratio for my, my camera which fits the asset that I'm rendering a little bit better. So um, when I was running through this tutorial before I figured out that basically the reverse of a widescreen which would be 1080 wide by 1920 high worked out pretty good for this. But as you can see because of the custom setting before, now our camera is really far back from, uh, from the payphone. Essentially what it did was it just added some more to the top and the bottom of my frame of reference. So now what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to press Alt-W to bring up my quad view. And then I'm going to select both the camera and the target. And I'm just going to pull it inwards and basically zoom it in on my phone so I get a, a nicer view of the phone, fills up more of the frame of reference. So now if we expand our camera view again, you'll notice something else too. When I did that, because of this uh, vertical aspect ratio, I get a little bit of a, a distorted perspective. It's a little bit exaggerated. And I actually kind of tend to like that too. It's a little bit larger than life. Uh, it's almost kind of a, a fisheye sort of angle or something. And it exaggerates our perspective lines. but you know, for, for me, I tend to prefer that sort of a thing. I feel like it's kind of nice, a little bit aesthetic. It sort of reminds me of, um, you know, some concept illustrations, the way that you see those designers, they have this style of really exaggerating their perspective lines too. So I think, especially for this asset, because it's tall and skinny, it's a, a comfortable, nice sort of perspective. So I'm going to go with that one. So the next thing that we're going to want to do now, obviously um, we have our camera angle. Now we need to have some lights. You can't have a nice render without lights. So once again, I'm going to expand my quad view. And what I'm going to do, um, what I usually like to do, especially for an asset, uh, if you're working with a larger scene, um, maybe in a full environment or something like that, then you might want to use a different lighting setup, maybe a more natural uh, lighting setup or a real world lighting setup, maybe a sun system or something. And if you're doing, um, you know, maybe an advertising render or something, then you might want to go for more of a studio lighting setup. But when dealing with game assets, 
I like to go for a fairly basic um, three-point light setup. It tends to get you know a nice direct light with some nice strong shadows and then uh, some simulated bounce light or fill lights. Um, so that's what I'm going to show you guys today. Uh, just a basic sort of three-point lighting setup, but also a very effective lighting setup. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to get my main light or my key light. So you go over to your lighting tab. I'm going to use standard lights and I'm going to choose a target direct light which tends to represent uh, more like a sunlight because the rays for a target light are parallel to one another as opposed to um, an omni light which all radiate out from one point, like a point light, or as opposed to uh, a spotlight, which diverge from the origin, which would uh, simulate more, you know, um, unnatural lights or uh, man-made lights. So in any case, I'm going to take my direct light to represent the sunlight, and I'm just going to go ahead and pull it out to a position that I think would be um, effective. So I'm just going to drag it out here until I get it a little bit far away. I don't want to put too close to my object because that would be more like a, a man-made light once again. So I'd rather go with, uh, you know, a little bit farther away from the object. Try to make it a little more realistic. So I'm going to bring it out from my top view to about here. And then I'm going to go to my front view and I'm just going to use the align tool, select my target, use the align tool to align it to my phone. Just make sure that it's targeting my phone properly. And then I'm going to turn on my grid here and I'm just going to drag the light up to a nice high point. A little bit higher. And drag it a little farther away too. That looks about good. Now, another thing that I like to do, which will help you with setting up your lights, uh, a really important aspect of your key light is to get some nice strong shadows. Um, you want shadows that kind of play across the form of your, your object and, you know, kind of accentuate the shape of the object and also have an aesthetic appealing sort of shape to the shadows. So, without you know, having to hit render over and over and over again so that you can see these shadows and then move the light again and hit render again. There's a nice way to really see those shadows in real time in Max. So what you can do, the first thing you need to do is go to your modify tab and turn shadows on on your light. And then um, for this tutorial I like to use ray trace shadows. Most of the time actually I find that they get uh, a nicer sort of feeling to them. They have a hard edge but um, when you start using some more advanced lighting, then you can get some bounce light that softens them up. Uh, so I prefer them to area shadows or shadow maps. So ray trace shadows, shadows on. Then what you can do is you come over to the shading mode here in your perspective, see where it says smooth and highlights, and you can scroll down to lighting and shadows, and see where it says illuminate with default lights, you can choose illuminate with scene lights. And then select it again and choose enable hardware shading and lastly you want to enable your shadows and then what's that what that's going to do is it's actually going to let you see your cast shadow if I maximize my viewport here it's actually going to let you see your cast shadow right within your viewport in real time so you can see what those cast shadows are doing and you can see how they're falling across your object and uh, whether or not that's aesthetic for you. Right now, actually looking at it, I already like where those shadows have landed. I got a nice shadow. It's kind of dark here, but you can see I have a nice shadow casting from the, the phone handle. The shadow from the top is not obscuring too much of the payphone itself, which is good. And then I have a nice cast shadow from the housing and from the stand going across the base. So I kind of like what those shadows are doing. So, let me just check one more thing, because it does look kind of dark here. No, I thought maybe exposure control was enabled, but it wasn't. So, now that I know where these shadows are, I can actually turn that off again. 
I just really put the uh, enable shadows and the hardware shading just so I can see what I'm doing with my shadows in the scene. And then I like to get that out of my way so I can see things a little more clearly. So the next thing that I want to do is I'm going to want to choose my, well, I'm going to call my light key light. And then I'm going to choose the light's color, which I like to go for a slightly off-white, um, slightly yellowish light, which once again simulates uh, the sunlight a little more closely. And then I'm going to take my multiplier and I'm going to turn it up a little bit. I'm going to turn it up to around 1.2, I believe. That should give me a nice strong light to illuminate the front part of my object. And then the next thing I want to do is I just want to check my shadows and make sure that I have a nice shadow density going on. Um, so we're just going to do a test render. I'm going to go back to my render setup here. And I don't want to do my test renders at my full render size because that's just going to be you know, really unnecessary. Each render that I do for my test is going to take a really long time. So I'm just going to go back to HD video here and I'm just going to choose a preset, a small one, 490 by 270. And then I'm going to go to my perspective view and pull out from my phone a little bit. So let's do a test render, see how these shadows are looking. and they are looking extremely, extremely strong. So, what we're going to want to do, a quick way to deal with that, is just to select the density and turn the shadow density down a little bit. So I'm going to bring that density down to around 0.75 and do another test render and just take a look at how that's working. And as you can see, now those shadows are looking a lot nicer. They're not quite too dark, which would be more realistic to real life because if this phone were outside in the sunlight, there'd be a lot of diffuse light bouncing off all of the buildings and other objects around it, and that would tend to soften the shadows up somewhat. So we have the nice placement of the shadows here, nice strong shapes, but the shadows themselves are not pitch black, which looks fairly good. So the next thing that we're going to want to do now uh, let me bring up that render again, sorry. You'll notice that we have some nice illumination on the front of the object, but the side of the object is completely obscured in shadow. That's because we don't have anything to represent the bounce light. Um, so again, if this phone were near an object or something, the reason we'd be able to see the sides of the phone is because there'd be light bouncing off of the surfaces nearby, possibly the side of a building or something. And then that would be using diffuse bounce light to illuminate the side of the object. It wouldn't be quite as strong as the main light rays hitting it, but it would still be fairly illuminated. So now what we need to do to simulate that is we need to drop in another light. And we're going to call this light a fill light. So I'm going to go ahead, and uh, for fill lights, I usually tend to like to use omnis. Um, they basically just they're point lights and they radiate light rays out from a single point. So in a three-point lighting system, most of the time your fill light would be almost um, on the other side of an isosceles triangle. So if the top point was your object and one point was your key light, then your fill light would be the third point of that triangle. So I'm just going to bring that fill light in over here and just eyeball sort of isosceles triangle shape and drop it in. Now I do want this fill light however to be down near the ground somewhat. Um, the reason I want it down there is because the light rays will bounce up and illuminate the side but it'll also represent the light bouncing off the ground a little bit so that I'll have it illuminating um, the side of the base as well. And let me just take a look here. It seems that the phone has lifted up off the ground plane slightly, so I'm just going to reposition it there. And then go back to my fill light. Now it's already on the ground, so that's good. And I like the position. But if we maximize the viewport, you'll notice that the phone is completely illuminated. It's a very bright light on the side now. 
The reason for that is because although I used a different type of light, an omnilight, what happened was it inherited the properties of the last light that I created. So my fill light right now has an intensity of 1.2, which it should not um, at all because that would mean that there were two suns shining on the phone. So I want to really drop this intensity down. And uh, usually for a fill light, what you would end up getting is uh, an intensity that's somewhere around a third of what the key light is. Now that's not a hard fast rule. That's more of sort of a guideline to start off with, but it's a good one. I find it usually tends to work. In some cases it won't. You might have to adjust the settings. The other thing is it's probably not going to be as warm as your key light. It's probably going to be um, a little cooler, or a lot of the time I find it tends to be nicer if it's a cooler light. So I usually like to use a, a sort of a bluish light, slightly saturated, a little bit towards the, the turquoise or teal side of things. Um, that just kind of simulates some cool bounce light. Maybe the surface it's bouncing off of has some color to it, and so the light that's bouncing off is picking up some of that pigmentation and then illuminating the side of the object. In any case, uh, you know, warm lights move forward and cool lights recede. So if you're putting it on the receding surface of your object, it's going to complement the warm light and really add some depth to your object. So now I've put my intensity to 0.35, which is roughly um, around a third of the 1.2 of my key light, and I've made it this cool color. I've also pulled it rather far away from my object, as you can see. And the reason I do that is because the light rays will diverge a little bit less if you move the, the fill light really far away. Remember in Omni, the light rays are all radiating outward. So if you put it right next to your object, you're going to get a really strong divergence of light rays. But if you pull it kind of far away, then they're going to start to move closer together um, and become more parallel, although not perfectly parallel, like your direct light. Before I go any further, I'm just going to save this uh, in case it crashes on me, which it can sometimes do, especially once I start my, my high-res renders. And now I'm just going to do a little test render to see the effect of my fill light and see if it has softened up some of those dark shadows and illuminated the side of my object. And yes, as you can see, we have some nice bluish illumination on the side of the phone and on the inside a little bit, and a little bit more down the side and also on the side of the base, which is exactly what I wanted. So I'm fairly happy with that illumination, and uh, I think I'm going to keep moving on. Now, sorry, I'll bring up that render one more time. The last thing you'll notice, it's not so, so visible, but we have an underside of the phone, um, this top piece here. And there's also an underside here which is not too visible. But in a lot of cases, you may have more undersurfaces. And you'll notice that it's almost jet black here. This is a fairly low res render, but if it were higher res, it would be very noticeable that this is jet black. That's also not realistic because this phone is on the ground and there would be light rays bouncing up off the ground. So I'm going to put in a second fill light to represent the light rays bouncing off the ground. So the easiest way to do that is just to shift drag a copy of your first fill light and have it as a copy. And then I'm going to zero it out by right clicking on the spinners of the translation boxes down here, which zeroes the light out so it should be directly under the phone, which is also what I want. And then I'm going to go into my front view and I'm going to pull it down rather far, not too, too far, but far enough. Once again, the reason I'm doing that is so the light rays don't diverge quite so much. And then the last thing is I'm going to want to turn it down a little bit. I don't want both my fill lights to be the same intensity. So I'm just going to turn it down to around 2.5 and assume that, you know, whatever the wall was that the light was bouncing off is a little bit closer than the ground. Maybe it's right next to the phone. I also don't want it to be quite as blue. Uh, I want it to be a little bit more whitish, um, just so we don't get 
too much blue light all over the phone. So once again, we will do a quick test render and see how that light has affected the phone. And it seems to be illuminating the bottom fairly nicely. So that's all right. Now, let me just check something out here. I thought I made a copy of that Omni light and not an instance. And I did. Um, but my second fill light seems to be lightening up the light on the side of the phone a little bit too much, too. So I'm just going to take that Omni that's illuminating the side of the phone and I'm going to turn it down ever so slightly to around three and I'm just going to darken up the color a little bit more. Do a last test render. And there we go. That looks much better. Now I'm getting some of the strength of my blue illumination back but I'm still maintaining the illumination on the bottom surface. So we'll give that another quick save. And now that we've got our lights set up and we've done our test renders and everything looks good, the only thing that's left to do is to go for our final beauty render. So I'm going to go back to my render setup and I'm going to go back to my custom settings. And since I created that camera before, then it's already there. I just have to go press C and as you can see there my phone is right on my camera and I just have to move it slightly back to the center because I adjusted its position before. Now the other thing that I'm going to want to do is right now I've been using just default render settings, the default scanline render um, and that was you know so that I could speed up the test render process but when you're going to go for a final beauty render you want to just adjust the render settings slightly from the default so that you can get a nice crisp um, but also a softer render to get rid of some of that sharpness and that um, staleness that you see on CG renders. So the first thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to change my advanced lighting. I'm going to turn on light tracer and what that's going to do is that's going to use ray tracer and uh, a global illumination multiplier with a little bit of a skylight setting to give some more natural feeling diffuse light over the entire model and also to allow actual ray tracing on the ray trace shadows to give those shadows a more realistic feeling. So whenever you're using ray trace shadows um, it's a really good idea to turn on light tracer. It does increase the render time significantly so I wouldn't do it until you get to your final render but it's definitely a good idea to do in your last beauty render. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the render settings and I'm going to use some filters on my render settings. Um, it appears that I already had them turned on because I do use them a lot uh, which might have been slowing down my test renders slightly but since I was using a really small size and I didn't have the ray tracer on it probably wasn't that noticeable. Um, but in any case, we're going to turn these on now. The first thing I'm going to turn on is I'm going to turn on an anti-aliasing filter. Now, um, I'm sure all of you are aware, aliasing is when you get a render, um, it's actually rendering pixels based on sampling the light and the various different colors of the object and the illumination on the various different pixels of your render of that object. But if you don't turn on an anti-aliasing filter, then what you're going to get is you're going to get some severe aliasing from the various different pixels, which is that uh, stepping sort of effect. So you want to use anti-aliasing of some sort. The area one is a really sort of a default anti-aliasing filter, and it ends up giving your image a really flat sort of overall blurred effect. It's not super blurred like a motion blur, but the result is perce perceivable and uh, it's not a really nice sort of result. So the one that I tend to like to use the most for still renders is Catmull ROM. What it does is it samples the edges using a 25 pixel filter which means a 25 pixel 
radius or diameter across the sampling area and then it adapts between those samples and gives a nice sort of blur to the aliasing but it has an edge enhancement effect so it blurs the aliasing but it also decides where the edge is based on the, the contrast of the image should be and it gives nice pronounced edge enhancement so the result that you get for your still render is a very crisp image but without the aliasing. So definitely Catmull Realm is my favorite for still renders. There are a lot of other ones in here to uh, play around with. Mitchell, Netravalia, and, uh, and some of these other ones. Cook variable is also very good. These ones are nice. Um, a lot of them tend to be better for animation. So you get the nice motion blurring that happens uh, when the objects move and stuff. But Catmull Realm is my favorite for still renders. Although I encourage you to experiment with the others. The last thing that I want to do is I just want to turn on a global super sampler and I like to use max 2.5 star. Now global super sampling is similar to anti-aliasing sampling but it's just an overall sample across the render which will try to give you um, just an overall smoother render that appears more natural and more lifelike. Um, I could really get into the tech of the global super sampling but that would be another tutorial in itself and there's a lot of documentation on that available so uh, we'll just leave it at that. Turn it on for your final render. You can play with some of these other ones but I like max 2.5 star. So now I'm just going to hit render and I'm going to pause my and through the magic of the pause button my render is now complete and as you can see it's a much nicer, crisper, higher res render than we had with our tests. We have some nice strong shadows in here and some nice soft sort of uh, diffuse shadows but with a very strong cast shadow shape. As you can see the effect of our bounce light is still nice and prominent. But overall a much nicer and crisper sort of render. So I'm just going to go ahead and save this out as my beauty render. Um, when you do one of these renders and you're going to be composing it later for a portfolio or something, and pretty much always actually, I tend to save it as a target file. Um, mostly because I want to be able to preserve my alpha in there so that I can get rid of this black around the background later. So you just check your setup and make sure that you have your pre-multiplied alpha checked off and put it up to its highest at 32 bits. You can always compress things later um, but these settings right here, compress pre-multiplied alpha and 32 should be perfect and I'm going to save this out as beautyrender.tga save. So now that that's done, the next step of this tutorial, I'm just going to turn these things off right away. Global Super Sampling, Catmull ROM, and my Light Tracer, because I'm not going to need those anymore. So, the next thing that we're going to want to do now is we're going to want to go ahead and create our wireframe or clay render. Um, that's always a nice one to create because game studios especially they do want to see your final result and they want to see how nice and gorgeous it looks with all of the texture maps applied, but they also want to see how efficient you can be. Meaning they want to see the contrast between your gorgeous looking final result, which looks all high poly and stuff using the normal maps, and your extremely low poly actual model. Um, this model was relatively low poly, it's under a thousand triangles, uh, including the receiver and the cable and everything else. So, to do that, I find the best way, and I find what a lot of studios tend to like, is they like to see a nice clay render, which gives a sort of diffuse light from all over, making your model look like it's made out of clay, which really uh, shows off the shape and the modeling. And then, when you overlay a nice wireframe on top of that, then that shows your actual topology of your model, and the triangulation, and uh, how efficiently you've actually modeled. So, 
I'm just going to turn off my custom here, go back down to just uh, some sort of a, a small size test render size. And let's get right into making this clay render. So the first thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to get rid of my bounce lights because I don't need those anymore since I'm doing a clay render which has diffuse light coming from all over. So we'll get rid of those. The next thing that we're going to want to do, actually let me just save it again, is we're going to want to make our material, our wire material. So we'll just move over from my phone material here and we're going to choose wire. And then there's a few things I'm going to change on this wire material. As you can see here we have a, a built-in wire material from 3ds Max. Um, but I'd like to change a couple settings on it. I don't like the, the diffuse gray color, so I'm going to click on the diffuse channel here. I'm going to make it pure white. And then the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give it a little bit of self-illumination here. Probably about, say, 12. Um, now the reason I want to do that is just because it will receive shadows um, and I don't want the wireframe to be completely obscured with the shadows. Even if it's in shadow, I do want the white of the wireframe to show up some, not too much. So I'm just going to give it, you know, a little bit more than 10% self-illumination. Now the next thing that we need to do is we need to apply our gray material to our model. And I'll just use a default gray for that. And then we need to actually make a model, um, a duplicate of our mesh, that's going to receive our wireframe. So, easiest way to do that is just to right click on the model, say clone, make sure it's a copy and not an instance, and uh, rename it your model underscore wire, just so you can differentiate between the two. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply my wire material to that, zoom in so I can see what I'm working with. And now the one problem with this is that it's an exact duplicate of the mesh. So the wire is sort of embedded within the gray geometry of the mesh. So the quickest and easiest way to fix that is to use what I, um, well not what I like to call, but what's called a push modifier. So I have it in my um, preset buttons here, but if, if you don't have it as one of the, those buttons, you can just open up your modifier list and scroll down and find the modifier name push right there. And it's a default modifier, it's built in, you don't need any special plugin for it or anything. And then you just grab the spinner here and just slide it along until it comes outside the model a little bit. You don't want it to go too far like this because then you're going to end up with a wire that's hovering above your model. So you just want to bring it out far enough that it's sitting far enough above your model when you pull your camera angle out, it's not going to appear to be embedded. So that looks fairly good for me. So I'm just going to back out now, take a look at it, and do a quick test render just to make sure that my wire is showing up. And it's showing up. It's going to look a lot better in the final render because this is really low res. The wire looks very thick and blurry. But the important thing right now is just that it's showing up even within the shadowed areas, which it is. So now the next step, you may have noticed that on that render, it did not look like clay. That's because we haven't put in our diffuse bounce light yet, or our skylight. So that should be our next step. So what we're going to do is maximize our viewport, or minimize, sorry, go to quad view. We're going to go back over to our lights, under standard, and we're going to choose a skylight. And what a skylight does is exactly what it sounds like it does. It simulates the overall diffuse light of being outdoors in the sky. So what we're going to do is just zero it out and then pull it up above the model. When you have a skylight in the scene it's not actually necessary for it to be above the model like a sky but I just kind of like to get it out of the way and it feels more aesthetic to have it above the model like the sky would be. So then we go over to our modify tab here and the default value is usually set to 1 
But because we have another light in the scene, which is already fairly strong, what we're going to want to do is we're going to actually want to drop the intensity or the multiplier of this skylight down quite dramatically, down to about a third or three. Once again, that's kind of to simulate the intensity of the bounce light, which is a third of your key light. But what I'm also going to do um, is I'm, I'm going to want to lower down my key light to compensate for the fact that we have this strong skylight in there, which is going to have bounce light coming from everywhere. So I'm going to take the multiplier of my key light, and I'm going to pull it down to about 0.75. It's not too far down, but basically the total of the two lights are going to add up to almost around 1. I'm going to leave the ray trace shadows on, because although we're going for this clay effect, I still want to have those shadows in there. But I'm also going to want to change the shadow's uh, intensity, or the, rather the shadow density, to make them somewhat stronger. So I'm going to take the shadow density, and I'm going to pull it all the way up to around 1.5. That way they'll still remain strong in the midst of the skylight bouncing all over the place. So now we're going to do one more quick test render, except it won't be as quick because we do have a skylight in there now. So we're going to have to wait a second because even though we're on a low render setting and we don't have any of those global, global super samplers or advanced lighting turned on, the skylight still has to bounce rays all over the scene and that's going to take some time. But from what I can see already, I have enough to know that it's doing what it's supposed to. I have my strong key light still illuminating the front of the object. You can see the wire showing up quite nicely. And my cast shadows are in place. And they're still relatively strong. But as you can see, there's also this nice sort of soft diffuse shadow um, that's giving a really nice form to everything. So I'm pretty happy with how that's turning out as well. So I'm just going to give it a quick save again. And once again, I'm going to go back and get ready for my final render. So let's open up our render settings dialog. We'll go back to the same size as before, our custom 1080 by 1920 aspect ratio. Then we're going to jump over to the renderer, turn Catmull ROM back on, and enable the global super sampler. But we're not going to turn on the ray tracing this time. Uh, that would slow things down so much and because of the skylight the difference between the final result would be negligible if it was even noticeable. So we're just going to leave those settings as they are and we're going to hit oh sorry we have to choose our camera and then we're going to hit render again and I'm going to pause the video once more because this is going to take a while. Okay, so the render's finally finished. Here we are back again. And as you can see, very nice high res, nice sharp shadows. The wireframe is coming through very nicely. And we have our soft, diffuse clay render along with our key light illumination. So that actually concludes this first portion of the presentation tutorial. Um, following this, in the next part, I'll be showing you how to take these renders that we've created now and compose them together in a single image along with uh, texture sheets and poly counts um, just to overall present it in a very nice, easy to read way that really shows off your work. And uh, we'll be doing that portion in Photoshop, so stay tuned and uh, until next time.